So this is the West Central Initiative, and they have established a very powerful network uh, having to do with early childhood. Early childhood is extraordinarily important to One World's government. Um, they have been trying for a long time to, to get control. They want control of early childhood. So there's legislation right now that's been going on for several years at a time here, uh, trying to, you know, they, they're giving more and more money. They're going, their policies are to close down the um, independent, a mom and pop sort of taking care of your kids. And they, the, the, um, the whole system, and I'm not going to go into that. That's a whole new thing. And I know I can, I can tell you someone who could come and do a presentation just on that, on, mm -hmm. on what's going on with early childhood. But the whole idea is pre birth on and they want the kids as quickly as possible out of the home they want to have control over the children and um it's all for the good of the children you know so you can see here the west central initiative early childhood initiative uh these are the communities that are involved down here becker clay douglas counties um they are setting that system up and it's it's a you know it's a worldwide system basically and let me move on to this these are original projects, early childhood dental network, school readiness, early childhood mental health initiative, family economic success, funds leveraged for West Central Minnesota since 2001, more than $7 million. Over here, you've got uh, the, the things that they're involved in. They're planning strategies around key components to raising healthy, thriving children, effective and coordinated early care and education. So uh -huh. that's their, that is their big plan. It's a huge thing. Early learning opportunities, ready schools. He says there are 90 communities throughout Minnesota that are part of this coalition building uh, around, um, around the state. And um, they involve, like it says here, parents, senior citizens, educators, business community leaders, faith communities, all these, they, they working behind the scenes relentlessly like i said they're paid staff that are um, that are working uh you know i, I can't say 24 7 but you know full time every uh week every year julie i i would add in support of that we actually have uh churches or faith communities here in Rochester that have child care centers attached to the church. And these are LGBTQRS alphabet type churches that are indoctrinating children at the very youngest ages. They do even have drag queen bingo night and it's a child friendly drag queen experience. It's a uh, reality. Wow. Get the children when they're young, leave them in daycare, drop them off, and let them be raised by uh, these professionals. I'll, I'll let you go on, Julie. Sorry. Okay, so that is basically a, a picture of the regional uh, development commissions that are established in state law, have been since 1969, and they are they they uh, pre uh, um, date they predate. Uh, the gender passage of Agenda 21. And so what I'm trying to tell you is that Minnesota has been part of this planning process. Agenda 21 didn't just come out of nowhere in 19, what is it, 92 that it was passed. I mean, there's a long process that's been developing ever since the UN was founded in 1945. Mm -hmm. And I will say, um, you know, Minnesota has been on the forefront of this from the beginning. Our uh, former governor in Minnesota, uh, Harold Stassen, who was a Republican, was one of the signers of the um, UN. Uh, the, and, and so it goes way back. We've been right there. And Minnesota has always been used, it, used as a prototype. And so um, we passed this in 1969. And it's been, it's, it's regional planning. So it's not your local planning. The people who are local think they're running things. And in fact, they're, they're not doing a whole lot. They, there's a lot they can do. I have to say, if they were very educated, if they knew what they were part of, if they knew what this was, there's a lot they could do but people for the most part have no idea. Like so, you showed us in part one, Julie, your information in part one, you showed us how they have a plan for every aspect of our lives. They have this thought out perfectly and then they have buy-in with local officials. They, they involve every level of government and a representative to participate in the regional development corporation. And then they're using public funds 
with private funds. And I guess we don't have any right to see who the donors are, but they're, like you said, probably NGOs and nonprofits with a lot of George Soros open society cash. Well, so the it's foundation, a lot of dark money. The, the big foundations do that. Yes, and the NGOs aren't the foundations. Oh. The, uh, the, well, they are technically, but I mean, the NGOs are the, the activist radicals, and they are the ones who are doing the planning. The foundations are doing the funding. Okay, um, so moving on. The next level that I'm going to go to is called the Minnesota Service Co-ops, MSC. They also are a government program. Okay, so now here we have another layer. <laughs> we have state government. We have these. I tell you, there are more, but I, I'm not going to go into them all. But these, this is the second one. They provide services. Uh, through collaborative partnerships. Mo these, the co-ops operate almost entirely within education, uh, the schools. Uh, so they, they say that their primary purpose is to provide uh, services that can be delivered on a regional basis much more cheaply. And oh. they do that. And, and they do do that. The problem is if it's not their main purpose, that is their, just their kind of overview. This is 1976, nine regional. So that was like seven years after the other, uh, you know, was established. Nine units were called Education Cooperative Service Unions. In 1995, they were just limited to calling it service cooperatives. The main purposes of a service co-op is to perform planning on a regional basis and to assist in meeting the specific needs of clients huh. in government units which could be better provided by a service community than the members themselves. So um, this again is establishment in law. And now they have their own bureaucracy. You have another layer of, of bureaucracy. These are also state government employees. 10 service cooperatives <laughs> hereafter referred to as SCs established. Geographic boundaries shall coincide with those identified uh, as this is the regional development organizations in, yeah. you know, so they're basically like yeah yeah it's just another layer right on top of the other one they can move money around basically and okay i just want to give you some examples uh -huh. so here is here are the different ones the northwest is the um up here the northeast service co-op lakes county source well now source well is particularly important because we have <clears throat> people there uh, who have done just an unbelievable amount of work in taking this apart. Sourcewell is very powerful. It's located, um, where is it? I, th I think it's I think, uh, Little Falls maybe, I'm not sure, but anywheres, it's that area. And um, we know a lot about all of the service co-ops because of the people in that area who have done the research for Sourcewell and it can be replicated. Now you see the Southeast Service Co-op, now they have a service co-op. They didn't, they didn't have a, a regional development organization. They have a service co-op. And then the Metro, that's really the Met Council. So here is, uh, you know, all in law, full membership is limited to public school districts, cities, counties, and other governmental units, but non-voting memberships shall be available to non-public school administrative units and other partnership agencies or organizations within oh. the service community. Again, you get the NGOs, you get the foundations. Sure. Now, the way they're set up um, is a school district, maybe law, okay, no school district, county or other shall be compelled to participate. So they don't have to. They're charged, by the way, for participating. So we're paying for it through our local school districts. Governing board, a majority of the members shall be current members of school boards. Um, and it can't be, okay, the, the, uh, the board <clears throat> can't be uh, less than six and, and not more than 15. So the way they do it is election of the school board members to the service uh, co-op board of directors is by a vote of all current school board members of participating public school districts with each school board member having one vote. So the, you know, the school board members of the whole service co-op area, uh, you know, choose a, uh, you know, a board member to be on there. So, I mean, it's very removed from the public. I mean, it's just like, yeah. how do you hold these people accountable? I mean, this is, yes, that is an elected yeah. official. That is a, 
uh, elected school board member. And that one member then serves on the board that will do all this planning for the whole service area that will affect the schools very uh, directly. Really? Does this seem like the Delphi system of meeting management yeah. kind of writ large on a Delphi societal management level? Yeah. So you're choosing team members from yeah. teams? Then that's yeah. an insulated group of insiders. I know. So, I mean, regional government, uh, you know, they, they say, well, it's, it's composed of, of elected officials. I mean, some of them are, a lot of them are, but the way you just described it, I mean, everybody's coming from different places and they, you know, they just don't represent their area. They don't, re they're not elected to that position. There is no election to that position. They're elected by other school board members. <clears throat> So here there's no knowledge of who's providing the funds to create all these management, you know, these $200 days or maybe $4,000 weeks where someone is carted off to this uh, resort and they have meetings that are going to determine our futures and our lives, but no one knows who's in the meeting and what interests they represent. It's a, it seems like the, the EU system of management where no nope, it's, it's the it's the eu right here in north that's america a, that's a good way to put it wes it really is the eu system <clears throat> that's the way they work so here it says this the board of directors employs a central administrative staff and other personnel is high necessary so they hire, they hire <laughs> people to do the work and so they're not elected those people aren't elected they hire people and who do they who do they hire they hire the, the activists. They, they hire the people who, you know, are the planners. <clears throat> They're doing all the planning. So, and we're paying for all of that. Um, then it says this, the, the um, board of directors may appoint special advisory committees composed of superintendents. So they can appoint committees, you know, all these from the representatives from here and there. And like you said, the Delphi technique is, you know, I mean, how do you, how do you have any accountability? You just don't. Um, okay, moving on. They, um, the board of directors may enter into contracts with school boards of local districts. Oh. Okay, they may enter contracts with other public and private agencies and institutions to provide administrative staff and other personnel as necessary to furnish and support agreed upon programs and services. So, so again, it be a bidding process whereby people make bids and then the contracts are awarded in a equitable, open, you know, we want to see what's going on with the cash that's moving around, right? Yeah. We want to know that the best deal, it's, or is it just a friends and family kind of thing? <laughs> like well, it's, it, it's, they're, they're encouraged to establish cooperative working relationships and partnerships with post-secondary public agencies, business and industry. So they are busy <laughs> creating these networks, creating these relationships, uh, putting people on boards, putting, you know, I mean, all of this goes on all the time. And it is, it is the government that is not elected. I, even though, like I said, some of the people on there are elected at their local level, but this is not an elected agency. And you get to the Met Council when you're in the metro area, I mean, they are completely, all of those are simply appointed by the governor, you know, so they're, I'm, I'm not dealing with the Met, Met Council, I'm just dealing with outstate Minnesota. Right. So here are some of the educational programs and services that they, the board of directors of each so, uh, service co-op shall submit annually a plan. The plan shall identify the programs and services which are suggested for implementation by the SC during the following year and shall contain components of long-range planning determined by the service co-op. These programs may include, but not, are not limited to the following areas. Now, um, just so you know, I mean, they, they've got all these plans that they're making and who is following this? Who's tracking this? You know, I mean, nobody, we can't, we can't, we don't have the resources to track, but look at, look at this, curriculum development. They're developing yeah, yeah. curriculum. Who's it's, paying? Yeah. This, yeah, this is in state law. Okay, they have a service co-op that is developing curriculum, and I mean, don't we don't we let school board members to do that? Don't we? No. Don't we let parents be involved with that? Don't we want no. teachers no. to be involved with that? No, we want some bureaucrats to decide. That's what it is. It's bureaucrats. So you've got 
Um, you've got publication and dissemination of materials, pupil personnel services, planning, planning. Look at it goes on. Secondary, post-secondary, community, <laughs> adult and adult vocational, employee personnel services, health diagnostic and child development services and centers. Sure. Leadership in or direction in early childhood and family education, community services cooperative purchase. And okay, so this is their so-called reason for being, and it's number 23. Um, <laughs> Co-op um, purchasing services. That's their, <laughs> big, they can say, that's their If you go to their website, now that's the big thing that they do, and that's what people are familiar with them with. The schools are very familiar with them to do their purchasing services because, you know, it's like you get it wholesale through them because they're a big buyer. Uh, so, Anyway, really? this, also this, because they're a big buyer, they can drive the textbook writing and the textbook publishing business itself. If they become a major powerhouse in terms of expenditures, the publishers will ask them what they want in the books. That's how the textbook system works in North America, but it's okay. business. But. Yep. So here you go. I'm trying to move this thing here. There you go. Move it up here. Okay, so they provide advice to state policymakers. Okay, so this is the legislators. Lobbying. Yeah, I mean, they're giving <laughs> it to them on a silver platter. And you know, keep in mind, they have at their disposal all the local networks of people that are the constituents of these legislators that they have worked, and put together. And these are not, I mean, some of these, I mean, these people are, I mean, they, they can just be real good people of goodwill. I mean, they are your yes. local, you know, your local whatever. And they, you know, they don't have a picture of this. They just are part of, yeah, we'll work on these things. So then when, when the service co-op pr uh, proposes, okay, here's the plan. Um, they've got this whole network behind them and it's all local. It's local for, to the legislator's own district. And also your, um, your um, local um, city council member. <clears throat> they um, facilitate interagency collaboration, promote development of services and programs for children, develop policies to fit services needs, anticipate future. Okay, so all of this is going on. And I'm gonna give you some examples of that <clears throat> in just a minute. Okay, keep in mind now, this is all in state law, okay? I mean. This whole, to, now we're looking at the second major layer with each one having its own, um, its own, you know, organization, its own staff, its own infrastructure. And, you know, and we're supposed to have a legislator to, legislature to do that. We're supposed to have county commissioners that do that. We're supposed to have city council members that do that. Mm -hmm. Now look at the bottom here. They are to act as a liaison encourage, support, and foster effective working relationships with national and state organizations. National, they might have said international because that's what it is. Financial support, okay. Financial support shall be provided by participating members with private, state, and federal financial support supplementing as available. So they assess and certify to each participating school district non-public administrative unit, city council, and other governmental unit, its proportionate share of all expenses. So that's the money is coming in from your all of these governmental units. Um, so, and then also they get to, uh, uh, you know, supplement it uh, with privates, that's foundations, state, federal financial support. They get grants. I'll tell you what, the legislature, what they do is that they'll have a program that they pass and they're gonna they're gonna allocate, you know, ten million dollars to this program, and they're gonna give it to the service co-ops to implement it. Mm. So I mean, they get the grant money, you know, that we put out for these legislative programs that we pass. Now, Sourcewell is the one that I told you that we know more about because, uh, but but each area has its own service. This is one of the service co-ops, and um, it is a organization partnering with education, government, and nonprofits to boost student and community success. So here they are, and they're getting all this money, and they're working with all our schools in the background, and our, our organizations, our, all of the community organizations. 
So here's an example, region five, which is that region five is, is, is a um, regional development uh, organization that is up in the, um, let's see, I, I could, sh I don't know if I wanna go back, but to the, um, to the map, but it's region five is like central Minnesota. Uh, it's like about uh, like a little bit north west of the metro area in there. And um, Cass, Crow Wing, Morrison, Todd, and Wadena counties. Okay, that's region five. So here you have the service co-op, which is Sourcewell, um, working with the um, RDO, the Regional Development Commission, region five, in providing intercultural, this is just one example, development inventory assessments, work groups and facilitation services to local units, school boards, nonprofits, private sector organizations within these counties. So they have a lot of regional influence. So this is a, uh, a, a whereas this is a, um, a contract that was put together uh, by region five with uh, the co-op uh, source well for the purpose of providing intercultural development inventory assessments. What is that? Mm -hmm. Okay, here we go on. Region five development corporation will pilot a welcoming communities program in one community delivering IDI assessments to five entities is very specific, facilitate one community-wide gathering to establish a welcoming communities advocacy group. So they're gonna create this advocacy group, which you know, when we hear about these groups in the news, you know, it sounds like it's something that uh, organically came up. Oh no, 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 no. It is totally planned and funded. Coordinate six quarterly meetings to facilitate completion of a community project that expands cultural agility, okay? <laughs> Our region five will deliver IDI assessments at the request of up to 10 local governments, of, of government school boards, economic development, or nonprofit organizations, or private sector entities that are not part of the pilot program. Okay, I'm gonna go on to what is IDI assessment? Intercultural Development Inventory, Individual Profile. This is, assesses the intercultural competence, the capability to shift cultural perspective and to adapt behavior to cultural differences and commonalities. The IDI allows the individuals and groups to increase their intercultural competence from how they currently engage cultural differences to how they can more effectively engage diversity. So we're talking immigration and, um, and um, what do you call it? Anyway, that's, the, the, you know, the-, well, the you, you simply the, wouldn't see something like that in China. You simply wouldn't see something like that in pick any Asian country in the Pacific Asia region. Central Asian countries wouldn't tolerate this. African nations wouldn't tolerate this. You wouldn't see this happening um, in, in, uh, in any community throughout uh, the world. I, I would say Central America and South America as well. This, this is just very strange to think that you're going to modify human behavior to such an extent that you want to shift their cultural perspective. We're being experimented with like we're in some kind of Petri dish and we okay. can just add elements, but this, okay, so this, this is on their website. I, I, yeah. that is not my language. That no, is no. their language. They are there to shift culture. They provide a customized plan for each individual that guides the person through a series of activities and self-reflections that build cultural competence. Uh, it's, so it, uh, it designs training and other interventions that increases cultural competence for groups and organizations based on the IDI profile results of each individual. So they're gonna administer that to government officials, to city employees and whatnot. I mean, we were told about this in Rochester at a public meeting at the public library, um, our city clerk explained to us how we're gonna have these bureaucrats, carefully trained bureaucrats interviewing employees and assessing their levels of intercultural, uh, you know, implicit biases and whatnot and how they can modify their thought. Pro it's, it's, a, it's very Marxist. It it's seems like the Gulag archipelago. 
And the way that this bureaucracy works, we have no access to knowing who's developing this curriculum. It's a Byzantine management system. Uh, it's Kafkaesque on an extreme level. It's the castle. Sorry to draw away from what you're saying there, but it doesn't seem very like, much like a republic at all. So now I'm going to go to here was I, was I, uh, um, I talked about <clears throat> facilitate uh, a welcoming communities advocacy groups. So they're talking about pilot a welcoming communities program. So what is welcoming communities? Welcoming America was established by Bill Clinton in 2005. Welcoming America launched the Welcoming Cities Initiative to advance the immigration agenda. Uh, the Welcoming Network works to transform communities into more inclusive places to change systems and culture by helping communities create policy and reinforce welcoming principles. The UN works with welcoming networks to place immigrants and refugees. So they set up these welcoming networks and they're the ones that they work through to decide where they're going to put the, the immigrants and the refugees. So I suppose then that ties in with the Vologs that receive the funding yeah. to parachute people into communities like uh, Lutheran Social Services and Catholic Charities and all the rest that have been just seeding people into communities and dropping them there. The UN, and they, the UN decides where they're going to go. And they, you know, these networks are set up, you know, to work with all these organizations you're talking about and, um, and bring them in. So here's the rest of the contract. Source well, shall compensate Region 5 Development Cor uh, Corporation a total of $15,000 for piloting one community-wide welcoming communities program and $2,500 per assessment for a total of $25,000 for delivering up to 10 IDI assessments to the above mentioned organizations and groups. Now, you know, that this is all pilot, you know, and um, so they, uh, it, was not, it was last January, a year ago, January, that this was signed and delivered. And so they actually, um, this is an example, Region 5. Now they're, they're um, advertising what they're doing, the IDI assessments assist our understanding and ability to uh, experience cultural differences and further develop individual group skills. Um, and this is another, there are 27 groups made up of 288 people completed IDI assessments, 80 individuals held one-on-one -on -one session for personal profile review. So it's very active, but like it's just getting off the ground actually. It's kind so, of scary, Julie, isn't it? It's scary if you're a government employee and you're suddenly pulled aside for one of these assessments and you're the person who's going to be assessed. It's kind of putting you on blast in terms of your cooperation with this agenda that they've put in place. And I think that that would have a chilling effect in the office place, or that would have a chilling effect upon people's ability to do their own job, or they might share with other people, gosh, they asked all these questions and they're assessing my feelings and they're assessing my thought processes. That would really get people to self-monitor and self um, uh, not self-reflect, but self-censor in terms of their creativity or things they might naturally want to work on at work, you would suddenly say, well, it's wrong for me to pay attention to uh, this issue of some fraud, waste, and abuse going on because it's not culturally appropriate for me to notice. I mean, it would have an effect of people like self-monitoring to extent that you might not enforce the speeding laws because you don't want to be accused of, you know, being in culturally insensitive. Yeah, well, you know, and you know, you have to realize that they're doing this with school board members. They're doing this with teachers. They're doing with this all kinds of, of uh, organizations that are, are civic organizations. They're doing it everywhere. And like I said, it's just the beginning. So, I mean, this is the first stages of it, but the, it is intended, and they are very explicit about that. It's for the whole community. It's for everybody. Um, wow. So here they work with, um, in partnership with this uh, Bloom Board. This is one of the other things that the service cooperatives do, working with districts across the state to offer a competency-based professional learning framework comprised of a series of micro endorsements which allow educators to prove efficiency in specific practice areas while accumulating the master's equal. So it's like CEUs, uh, you know, oh, continuing education oh, credits. They're going to be and, rewarded. 
they'll be rewarded once they finish the well, master's equivalent credit hours, they can get salary incremental steps. They, they also are required to have a certain number of CEUs every year. And I mean, teachers and, and administrators, and teachers, as part of the program, educators will have the ability to choose from a selection of pre-approved specialized personalized STEM, computer science, social emotional learning, which is a whole area, cultural competency. Now, I, I'm not going to go into this because it's a whole nother area, but um, the state is requiring cultural competency training for uh, teachers in order to be uh, licensed. And um, we have, we, Child Protection League went into a huge battle uh, with the um, licensing board over their right to do what they're demanding. And, um, and it's a knockdown drag out um, and they have the upper hand on that right now. But the one thing that, that we got out of it is that they're not, that, that, that the training isn't required to be how they define it. And that was a big thing. As long as you have other people doing training that isn't including all the, you know, the leftist uh, jargon. Well, here you have, um, here you have the service co-ops who are doing the training for the teachers, see? And you also have the, um, the, the teacher union and you have um, right. some, so they're, they are the ones who are doing the training for teachers for cultural competence. And if you, if you look at the, uh, all, all of that is implicit bias. It is, it is um, critical race theory. It is, it is white supremacy the whole shooting match and teachers are now being trained. They have to, they have to, by law, they have to take some, uh, they have to have certain CEUs in cultural competency. And the only options available to them uh, is, is the really radical kind because that's who's doing it. And here you have this group the, um, that is, do, they're one of the groups that can do it. You know, they pay, they, they, this is what they do. Culture competence, social emotional learning is a whole other thing that is just terrible. But um, anyway, so this is uh, the kind of thing that you can do as part of the Minnesota, I mean, the, the service co-ops, yeah. Mm -hmm. So we got that. And then I just wanted to tell you, I'm not gonna go into, oh, okay. That just the fact that, um, in, not going into any detail, published in 1998 under Arnie Carlson, it is the, it says that, um, that that this is we are committed in Minnesota to an ambitious plan called Agenda 21, and then it's very explicit. It's been used as a guide um, to similar public-private efforts at national, state, and local levels, and um, it's called Sustainable Development: The Very Idea. This is the document, is what it looks like, <laughs> and he really set the whole framework for Minnesota to be completely in sync with Agenda 21. He said it was a Republican. It, Let's not forget he's a Republican, so that it's not like this is a Democrat Republican issue. No. This is a, yeah. I wouldn't I wouldn't be so kind as to say he's a Republican. Because, oh, he, uh, I know somebody who got the endorsement away from him, but um, okay, it, it happened to be his last name was Chris. So uh, good. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> okay, look at this. Minnesota policy changes include Chapter Fifty Four, Minnesota Law. 1996 requires all state agencies, all the departments and all boards to assess how well their mission and programs reflect and implement the roundtable's principles of sustainable development, which is Agenda 21, or how they could be changed to do so. A community-based planning act of 1997 lays out 11 goals which define a framework for community-based comprehensive planning. That is Agenda 21. And, and so that is in law that all state agencies, departments, and boards have to assess how well they comply with that. And again, launch a visioning and planning process to chart the community's future. This is all their stuff, their, uh, you know, measure progress, pr producing implementation, and so on. So MADO, the Minnesota Association of Development Organizations, brings all of these org planning agencies, that would be the regional commissions, uh, together under one heading, and they are creating the, um, uh, the state plan and um, develop Minnesota is called. And you can see down here, they've got the Met Council down here. Mm -hmm. And like I said, this is a regional development organization so that there isn't one in Southeastern Minnesota. However, they work obviously hand in glove with the big kahunas in Southeast, which is Mayo and Hormel. 
Um, and, so, and Julie, can you can you um, can you sort of wrap it up in about two minutes? But okay. I I just want to say a couple things, and then uh, we have to continue this in a third segment. But okay, please. So basically, this is the kind of overview that they they do. They do comprehensive planning, curriculum development. Uh, the, the regional planning organizations and the service co-ops work together. They're established in law, making long-term plans for programs and policies, vocational training, comprehensive sex ed. They do training in comprehensive sex ed. Cultural shift, IDI, early childhood, child care centers, training programs, all in compliance and in coordination with the uh, uh, sustainable development goals. And uh, in rural Minnesota, there, um, you know, you have an initiatives that, well, I'm, I'm not going to go into that implementation. I wanted to just mention to you that uh, I don't, I, I don't, I don't have it in here. We'll, we'll leave it at that because I wanted to give you some examples of how the sustainable development goals out of the UN is, um, is, is uh, requiring comprehensive sex ed. And so the whole comprehensive sex ed and the gender identity things it's all incorporated into um, uh, this, the, uh, the, the planning work of, um, of, of the UN. And so when you have people who are working at your very, 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 very local level, and they are doing it all in compliance with that, that's why you get, I mean, all of a sudden, they're all on the same page. They're all working off the same plan. And Julie, that's uh, again a good place to end as we began talking about how getting the children away from the parents at the very youngest ages will help implement their plan to colonize people's uh, minds and the rest of their lives. As I think it was Marx said, if you give me the child, I'll show you the man. This is truly a brave new world that we're living in in Minnesota during the lockdown from Governor Walls. And uh, it seems that the information we've talked about today shows us how the colonization of Minnesota is really in effect. And I would, I would expect this level of bureaucracy and efficiency from United, United Nations bureaucrats and EU bureaucrats who now seem to be out of work in a lot of areas of the EU as uh, that system continues to spiral out of control. But here in Minnesota, the plan continues and uh, they are just doing it full speed ahead. Agenda 21 and Agenda 2030 are in full effect as we're in the lockdown here in Minnesota. Julie, please come back for a third session, please. Can we do this again in a continuation of your slideshow. Um, and also we have to have you come to Rochester as soon as we're able. Does that sound good, Julie? It seems, well, we'll see how things go. You know? We'll see how, yeah, we will. Okay, thank you, Julie, and thanks again. Yeah, bye-bye.